Welcome again, <clears throat> Litigation Psychology Podcast, brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. This is Dr. Bill Kanaski, one of my best friends, one of my closest colleagues, Dr. Elisa Parker, joining us today with a great topic. Elisa, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? <clears throat> I am. Um, I'm doing a lot better today. It's been a rough week. It's been a rough week. And the temperatures in Florida are going down into the 30s next week. So when you and I are hanging out next week at that mock trial, it's not going to be, you need to pack appropriately. But I heard, I heard it's not been exactly warm in, in Texas. Is that true? Actually, I hate to say this, but it is a gorgeous day today out here. Uh, gosh, <laughs> it's, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous here too. Um, but that's going to change very quickly come, uh, come Monday night. Now you've been a guest on the podcast before, but can you re cause this is a very important topic that we're covering, that covering today. Um, can you remind our audience ab about your background and training prior to litigation psychology? Cause you have a very clinical background like me. Right. So, um, my PhD is actually in clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. And so not only did I work as a clinician as part of my education, so in like practicums and internships and so on, but I actually practice um, for quite a few years in the field prior to moving over into what I do now as a litigation consultant. Um, so I actually have quite a bit of hands-on clinical experience when it comes to psychology. And particularly with emotions, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And not just emotion, but um, my background is actually very specific to trauma-based care. Speaking of trauma, that's our topic today. We, you and I have worked on several cases, and then we have one right now, which we will not identify or um, describe. We'll keep it very generic. Um, we work on a lot of cases where there's trauma in, involved, and much of that trauma, well, it comes really in two forms. It's memories of an event that a witness has to talk about during testimony, which can be really a devastating um, experience. Um, I've personally seen some PTSD uh, with, with, with people um, <clears throat> that are forced to think about things from uh, the past that are very traumatic, such as accidents. You know, we do a lot of uh, the, the, the trucking work, um, you know, tra transportation uh, in general. Uh, or they have to recall some pretty, pretty ugly uh, events relating to, you know, death, catastrophic injury. <clears throat> and lately, you know, particularly in the last 10 years, the technology available um, to transportation clients, the vast majority uh, of these events, which are tragic, um, uh, are on videotape. And um, for example, in trucking, uh, usually there's multiple uh, cameras on trucks, um, a lot of the dash cams. And these are really meant to, I think, protect the companies, right, to secure really what happened. But um, some of these accidents are horrific, right? I mean, just, just, I mean, just absolutely hor horrific. And then litigation um, starts. And most of these witnesses are trying to do everything they can to forget <laughs> about um, the trauma that they've that that they've suffered. And you know, most times when you think about trauma, emotional reaction, you're talking about the plaintiff, right? What the plaintiff's gone through, the plaintiff's injuries, the plaintiff's, you know, psychological and emotional damage from a certain event. But that happens on the defense side too, right? Absolutely. And I think that's so frequently yeah. overlooked. Um, in fact, I've worked with quite a few truck drivers who have to be in therapy yeah. as a result of accidents yeah. or um, that make comments about, you know, what you think of as just your, your classic PTSD. So reliving it in their mind, experiencing nightmares, difficulty sleeping, increased anxiety, and so on. Yeah. And, and, and I know we're talking about trucking. Of course, it's not just the trucking industry. No, it's, it's, been it's, it's everybody. We, yeah, we work with a lot of um, munis. I think we work with the largest, the largest, uh, it's, it's one of the largest cities in the country. And we work with, you know, their train operators, their bus drivers, all that stuff's on videotape. And yeah, bus, buses get into accidents, buses hit pedestrians, trains um, hit pedestrians. And I've, 
I've seen a lot of these folks after after the accident not be able either not be able to t- return to work for like six months because there's just mental basket cases or they just quit altogether, even if they did nothing wrong, because they just don't want they don't want to be in that that operators um, chair anymore. So before we jump into how to kind of ha- how to handle um, things uh, with the video, some of the mistakes I've seen made. Uh, by defense counsel. It's not their fault. They don't have training like you and I do because I have clinical psychology as well. Um, I've seen a lot of mistakes kind of jumping right into the case pretty pretty quickly during during witness meetings. I did this on our the podcast I did yesterday is uh, you know, there's a lot of little things that need to be done before you start reliving the event. Have you seen some of the same mistakes with defense counsel that can actually make they can make the witness worse, right? Yeah, I think if they're not properly prepared or emotionally ready to see it. Hmm. Um, and then the other aspect of it is not just kind of jumping in really, really fast, but also it's how is it processed after they're exposed. Um, and of course, we're, we're speaking to videos. I think of still photos also as a potential uh traumatic trigger as well yeah and so the now the the problem with with litigation is that from the time of the incident to the time where say one of these drivers or or operators has to be deposed substantial time goes by and if they're not treated effectively in between that time um they can get a lot worse um they could just suppress everything can you talk about what suppression is what that means psychologically and then (laughs) you know you suppress something right and then for a year and then a year goes by and Mm -hmm. then you get a a a letter from an attorney or an email or phone call saying hey we want to meet with you you know discovery is starting can you can you talk about how witnesses can suppress things as a defense mechanism to get through the immediate but how that could be disastrous a year later Absolutely. I think that um, what I think of when I think of suppression is kind of the the concept of compartmentalizing um, almost, you know, and kind of its basic terms, the idea of like putting it in a drawer and closing it. Mm -hmm. So you're not thinking about it. You've completely shut off anything related to it as much as possible um, because that's how they're coping um, is by just acting almost as though it didn't happen um, in no way trying to experience Um, what that was like. I think you get a letter from an attorney, that drawer opens a crack. Um, So you've done a good (laughs) job of avoiding it Mm -hmm. um, in any way possible, but a little bit's leaking out now. Um, And then you go to a meeting with the attorney, you're maybe exposed to a video or a photograph or some other piece of evidence, that drawer goes from being just slightly cracked to wide open. Um, most of these people have never dealt with these emotions, yeah. which means yeah. that it's going to come all rushing or pouring out in that moment. Which is horrible. Um, now, I guess some, some good news, um, you know, some corporations, some companies have employee health services. And after an incident like this, they can send them <clears throat> psychology, psychiatry, their general, general physician, um, for treatment. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there, there still remains this mental health stigma. And I see a lot of these people when I first meet them and um, their emotional dumpster fires. And the first question is like, well, what have you been doing the last six months to address these issues? Maybe 80% of the time, they're not getting treatment or they don't, they don't want, they, they kind of want suppression <laughs> as opposed, as opposed to the to the, to the processing of it, because like you said, it's either all going to come out at once and it's going to be ugly. Um, can you talk about kind of the role? Cause I think our attorneys need to know this. If they have people, they need to, you can't force anybody to go to therapy or psychiatry for medications. Right. But I think you can strongly suggest it and point out um, the pros of that well before discovery gets started. So when discovery gets started, they've they're they're climbing up that ladder to to healing and recovery can you can you talk about the importance and and kind of what happens in therapy with people that have been through trauma since that's your expertise that can 
that can get them more mentally healthy and emotionally stable before they, they walk into a, a law firm of, of all places, maybe the most stressful place to go? Um, sure. So I think the reason why a lot of people choose not to go into therapy is a lot of what you said. There's still a lot of stigma. A lot of people feel like they can handle things just fine on their own. Um, and then the other aspect of it is, unfortunately, this is just short term, but when you're using suppression or you're compartmentalizing, it feels better. Um, because when you're having, when yeah, you're having does. to actually address everything, it's gonna feel awful yep. initially. Um, so yes, if therapy is an option and sometimes people need resources, some people need to know where mm -hmm. to turn, um, and so on, as you mentioned, sometimes companies are, do have resources available, um, but actually starting to address trauma. So one big part of it um, is number one is um, addressing the underlying emotions associated with trauma. Um, so is are there irrational thoughts related to it? Are there very rational thoughts related to it? But those need to be a, kind of ferreted out and begin to be addressed. Um, I know, for example, so for a trauma, um, if we're working with a witness who needs to watch a video, we need to find out things like, um, what are their concerns? Is there a concern that if they were to watch the video, it's going to re-trigger trauma that they yeah. experienced before? Are they worried that it's going to be a new trauma that they haven't experienced? Are they worried they're going to learn something they did, didn't already know? And so on. So it's the same idea in therapy. You're really addressing the initial emotions associated with it. Um, and then honestly, depending on what the trauma is, but some degree of exposure is critical. Yeah. Um, so whether that's, I know for, for example, in uh, trauma-based cognitive behavioral therapy, once um, the client is in a position, so coping is put into place, some emotion surrounding the trauma has been addressed, um, the client actually needs to retell the story. So from start to finish, they actually have yeah. to say what occurred mm. to them. So exposure starts to play a very important role um, in the healing process as well. And if you start to do that before the attorney calls and wants to start preparing you for a deposition, then yeah. you're already 10 steps ahead of what a lot of other witnesses would be at. I, I, I totally agree. Um, this also happens in a lot of our med mal cases, particularly like birth injury cases. Um, where you're having, you know, OB nurses, OB physicians, um, speaking of irrational thought, the one I, I've come across uh, the most <clears throat> in the last 18 years, particularly from the healthcare folks, uh, a lot, and a lot with these birth injuries or, or, or mom dies during birth or, or baby, uh, dies or, or sustains a significant, you know, anoxic brain injury or something, <clears throat> um, is the illogical thought of this is all my fault. I mean, my, my job is to protect the baby. My job is to protect mom. Something bad happened. It's my fault. And can you talk about how that's a very kind of common, common reaction, particularly in healthcare, but it's also illogical because listen, birth is not safe. <laughs> there, it's, it's a high risk and, and there are high risk pregnancies and high risk deliveries and things like that. And it's been my experience that um, a lot of these nurses and physicians just completely just assume, you know, I'm completely responsible because I was in charge or I was in charge of baby or I was in charge of mom. Uh, can you talk about how how um, um, th that's a that's a pretty common, uh, but also illogical response. That's a response that will kill us in deposition, right? We just talk about how how common that is and, and where that comes from. I think it's extremely common, um, in large part because I think what we forget about sometimes too is that um, depending on the situation, a lot of these physicians and nurses have pre-existing relationships. With that's patients. a that's an excellent point. Whereas in tr transportation, you don't get that. That that's Thank right. you for bringing that up. Yeah. And of course, there's some cases where that's not the case, but in, in a lot, um, they've been treating them for some time or they've been a long-term patient, or even if it's more short-term, they've still had multiple visits with that patient before, yeah. let's say, going into a surgery or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, when you go back into time and you make that physician or nurse or other healthcare provider really put themselves back into the moment, 
a, a huge number of them are going to stand by their care. However, they don't have that luxury because now there's an outcome. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. I think what they're doing is what just human nature. And that's the what if game. When mm. something goes wrong for any one of us, yep. it, you don't even need to be in the medical field. Just as a human being, when something goes wrong, you start to play that game in your mind. And unfortunately, it's such a dangerous path to walk down. What if I had taken a different route? What if I had left five minutes earlier? Now you apply it to medicine. You know, what if I had done this test? What if I had just rushed to surgery a little bit earlier? What mm -hmm. if I, and even though all their decisions made sense in that moment, it's so hard not to question if we had just done something differently. And then they start to just readily and easily agree yeah. um, to having made mistakes or bad decisions in their care. Yeah, that's very difficult. Now, before we get into how you and I deal with traumatic video, traumatic uh, images and and pictures, and, and I covered this on, on my last podcast, but I want them to hear it from you too, um, is I truly believe attorneys can do some things um, well before witness prep meetings to do some things to create some trust, um, bond with their, with their witness, let them know that they care, but also do a little bit of a, for lack of a better term, armchair psychological um, assessment by simply making calls, checking in on these people. Um, what are some of the questions? I had mentioned things like you ask about like eating, you know, are you skipping meals? right? Are you skipping meals? Cause you're so nervous. You mentioned the nightmares thing and sleep. What are some of the things that attorneys may not usually ask <laughs> their clients, but maybe they really should just because I think if they hit on one of these issues, the witness will open up and say, well, yeah, actually now that you mentioned, and I'm not sleeping well, what are some of those issues that maybe the attorney can just kind of gently ask about <clears throat> to not just assess the witness, but also to show, Hey, as a human being, not just your attorney, as a human being, I care about how you're doing. <clears throat> I think one of the huge things, this is something that I ask pretty much every client and some will, or I guess witness, I should say um, every witness that in, inevitably someone will say I'm fine, but very mm -hmm. quickly yeah. find out they're not. And that's just, how are you doing? How are you feeling yeah. about this case particularly? Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're about to be deposed. Um, I cannot tell you, I mean, people almost immediately start sharing how yep. they're feeling about stuff. And as I mentioned before, a lot of times people will make comments like, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, and I think I've mentioned this in previous podcasts as well. <clears throat> Very quickly, though, once they start talking, you realize yeah. they're not fine. And I think yeah. it's also helpful to reflect that back to them. You know, like you said, you're fine. But when I'm listening to you talk, you actually seem pretty frustrated or this seems like it's really stressing you out. Um, and then that opens their ability to be able to discuss that in more depth. So I like your idea of, of asking very specifically about how they're sure. functioning in essence, how are you sleeping, how yeah. are you eating things along, you know, you going to work, any issues, things along those lines, but just as easy as how are you feeling about this case? Yeah. I think that's really important because the witnesses will, um, they will open up. And the other thing that again, when you're an attorney, <clears throat> it's hard to put yourself in a client's shoes. I think, um, you know, by definition, these people are not, these witnesses are not a, a, outside of therapy and their attorney. Who who can they talk to? They can't. They can't discuss the accident with the coworker. You can't do. You're going to be in tr big big trouble if you do. Right? Technically, I guess you could discuss. I think there's some spousal privilege, but you can't go to your friends and start talking about the accident. So <clears throat> it almost forces this pressure is mental pressure cooker where they can't vent. So I'm a big fan of these kind of small touches just by phone or even by zoom doesn't have to be in person just to kind of get that, you know, Hey, how you doing uh, information. So if something's going wrong, I mean, we always talk about this with, 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 with our cases, right? Hey, if you, if you got an issue, you know, don't call me two months before trial, call me <laughs> two years before trial. I mean, I'm assuming clinically your opinion is uh, the sooner you find something wrong, you know, e emotionally, the sooner it can be dealt with. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I love your idea of, kind of the regularly small touches 
Yeah. Um, just to, to make them, I, th I think some witnesses feel like it's your job to defend a company or defend yeah. something at a higher level and not them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important as well. Um, Bill, I'm curious, you know, I, I have heard from some attorneys that they actually have concerns about their witness going to therapy. Um, I'm a strong proponent of it. Uh, what, I'm going to turn this on you. What would you say about that? I mean, you, you've met attorneys that don't want them to go to therapy, essentially? They have some concerns about the discovery, the discoverable nature of it, what might come out of therapy, things along those lines. I, I, I don't, I think that's fully protected. I think it's fully protected on a number um, of levels. I haven't had any um, attorneys have any issues with that. Um, we need to talk to an attorney about that. I, but that hasn't really that hasn't really come up. But I, like you said, um, if all else, I mean, I'm very I'm a big fan of of of, of mental health. Uh, treatment. And also, I mean, think about it. If you're an attorney, you're a defense attorney. I, I mean, what's your ethically, what's your main concern, you know, discoverability or the mental health of your client. So I, I mean, I, I would think maybe you have an ethical responsibility to particular if somebody says, Hey, I need help. That's no, 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 don't talk to anybody. <laughs> I think they'd have an ethical, ethical responsibility to do that. That's an excellent question that I'm going to ask. Maybe I'll ask Mike Bassett about that. He's, I told you, poor Mike's down with COVID, right? Yeah, he's um, poor guy. Uh, it's spreading. Advertise like, that to everybody. What? Oh, he know he he knows everybody. <laughs> everybody has it. Everybody has it. Sorry, Mike Bassett. We love you. Um, he's doing good though. Um, okay, let's talk about how we deal with these very negative stimuli in the form of um, accident videos uh, and and images. Um, is it your opinion, uh, that, um, I've, I've heard, and I've talked to several attorneys, <clears throat> some attorneys are like, I, I like to ease them into this. Now you and I, we come from the same training. I'm, I'm a big fan of system, yeah, systematic, yeah, systematic desensitization, <clears throat> meaning, meaning, you know, going one step further every time to get somebody, you know, to the spot where they can um, emotionally and mentally handle the, the full stimulus. <clears throat> um, um, just like you train somebody to get through a phobia, right? Um, I've heard others that say, nope. <laughs> I had an attorney say, um, no, nope. tell them to go home, get a bottle of scotch, lock, lock the door in their bedroom and just freaking watch it and get through it. And I'm going, oh God, like, yeah. Talk about how you and you and I have a case together uh, uh, on this, how you, you think the best way to approach this. Now, every witness is different. I've had witnesses that no, no, I'm, I'm good. I've assessed them as good. They've convinced me they're good. I, st I still do the systematic thing. I don't, I don't just jump right into it. Even with those people, they, I can handle, I can handle it. Other people's much more fragile. What, what do you think the best approach to this is? <clears throat> Um, I'm with you in that I agree that the graded exposure kind of at, in small pieces, kind of digestible pieces is the most effective. So if it's a video, portions of the video um, at a time, I think you mentioned for some videos, you might do it without the sound on, you know, things along those lines. That's what I did. That's what I did yes, with that video. Yes. I, and I think that that's a, a great I got up idea. At four, I got up at four um, o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I got to watch this freaking video. I don't want to watch it, but I got to watch it. And it was, yeah, there's audio with that particular, which is even worse. Right. So yeah. I just could, I, I watched it three times. I paused it a couple of times. I just didn't want to hear anything. I, I just, I, me, the freaking psychologist jury consultant couldn't handle that. And so um, that's an idea. And then you and I had come up uh, with the idea um, which I used with our client is to, we, we had the video up and we just kind of went through the timeline and kind of used the stills and kind of said, Hey, here's what's happening. And so I think it was like a 15 minute video and like every 30 or 45 seconds, we just clicked and then you'd see the frame change and see the frame change. Um, I think, I think that's a good way to um, particularly when you have really bad video 
uh, because I think otherwise, if you just show it, there's just too much mental buildup. And it's, it's kind of like you're watching a movie and you know, the bad guy has the knife and he's hiding behind the curtain and the person walks in and you're like, no, right. I mean, isn't that what you're trying to do there is to kind of give the, give, give them the information in safe chunks so that they can process it bit by bit. Is that what we're trying to do here? Yes. So I like the idea of graded exposure, just like that. I like the idea of debriefing yeah. after that. Um, I think that's incredibly important. Yeah. Um, and then kind of going along with the, you know, systematic desensitization, then it's got to be on repeat. Yeah. Um, so you have to basically create what, you know, what we call habituation, which is um, once they've been able to get to a point where they can watch something in its entirety, then they need to get a little bit accustomed to watching it so that they're not having an emotional reaction to it. So once they become accustomed to the video, then that emotion starts to go away. Um, and you need yeah. that to happen, obviously, prior to deposition. Um, otherwise, the oh, yeah. emotion's going to be coming out. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, what I've done is, again, I think it's important because then you get to the point where, okay, I'm going to play two minutes of this video and then we're going to debrief. The key is the debriefing. And what are you asking during the debriefing? You know, how you feeling? Are, are you going to cry? Are, are you upset? You really have to do your assessments. So this is a very um, clinical process that I think, again, with all due respect to defense attorneys, I think they could screw this up pretty quickly and make a witness worse by not following this methodology, which is why I think our, our role is so important. And then, like you said, as they start to be able to process this information and you know then the nice thing about this stepwise procedure right if someone breaks down and gets upset what do you do you you stop and you process right i mean that's what you do so i think that's a good way to do a video and then you get to the point where you can play the whole video but that may take an hour that may take a half a day that may take three days i think it's going to be uh different for everybody I think everybody comes in with a different um, cognitive and emotional wiring. Um, and I think that's why the witness assessment is so important because I, th I mean, I would argue, and I, I think you'd agree is that you, you probably want to make a unique plan like this case, you and I have already said, yeah, you're taking these three witnesses. I'm taking these three. They're wired very, we're probably going to do things pretty differently to get the result based on our assessment. Correct. Yeah. And if that assessment is skipped, that's where things can get worse. And then you have a bad witness. Now, the nice thing about the video is that you can kind of manipulate it, jump around like we're talking about. If you just have crime scene photos, images, uh, though, I think those are tougher to deal with because you can't jump ahead. I mean, I guess if you have a series of photos, you can start off with the... <clears throat> least sensitive ones do you think that's the bright idea there yeah and you can talk about it um so you can before you show the picture you can talk about what's in it um kind of as the graded exposure part of it you're right you don't have kind of the flexibility that you might have with a video but um but that's not to say that you can't still talk about it that you can't ask what their kind of independent memory is um mm -hmm. things along those lines before you actually show the photo um, which is very impactful, not always the same impact as a video, but potentially. And I also, th I mean, again, I, I don't agree. Uh, you tell me your thoughts. <laughs> I don't agree with the, okay, here's a stack of photos. You go home, go through them, and then I'll meet you next week. I mean, I think that could be a recipe for disaster, right? I mean, my concern, especially in combination, if you haven't thoroughly assessed this witness prior to giving that, to even know kind of where they are mentally um are they experiencing trauma themselves as a result of this and so on um i think that you have the potential yes for um for anything from a witness kind of disappearing on you to something potentially extremely sinister um in the sense of can they even mentally handle this how is it going to impact them um some people we've worked with are extremely depressed yeah um and so that would be my concern for example with someone who's very depressed doing that by themselves um and so on got it well th i think this provided a lot of good guidance for our clients attorneys out there um there's a right way there's a clinically and scientifically proven way to do this 
Um, and we don't want to make your, your, uh, we don't want to make your clients um, worse. <laughs> we, we want to get them through this. And there's plenty of cases out there that have a lot of trauma. And even, I tell you what, I think another kind of big mistake I see, which I know you've dealt with, are cases in which there's maybe a bad outcome, but not necessarily traumatic stimuli. It, it's just the bad outcome. Like a lot of these, because uh, obviously there's not a lot of video coming from MedMal, right? They're not videotaping <laughs> verse like that, uh, but there doesn't have to be something gruesome to get the same, the same impact. Sometimes just um, talking um, about it, particularly with nurses. I know that you know, with some of these birthing injuries, <clears throat> you know, time goes by and maybe the child survives, but they have a disability and um, you know, there's a, uh, you know, there's a day in the life video or, or something like that, that kind of, that, that kind of shows that it can happen across the board. Um, I think with any, with, with, with any bad outcome. So I think the key here, our take home message is uh, be careful with this stuff. Call us for help. Happy to help. We do this um, all the time because uh, there's a lot of cases out there. And um, yeah, as the technology grows, you know, you got particularly on these, buses and train. I mean, you got multiple video from multiple angles, um, premises liability. Look at those cases we've worked on where you're seeing, you know, people getting shot or raped on, on video because there's a surveillance camera. <clears throat> it's pretty tough, tough stuff to, to watch. And I think there's a, a good methodology to follow. Well, Elisa, thank and you. If I could oh, add, I'm yeah. just going to add one more thing. I yeah. apologize, but no. you know, you kind of mentioned the idea of like leaving a witness on their own to watch something. Another thing that I see is um, attorneys kind of feeling like, oh, this is a really bad video. We don't want the witness to have to go through this. And so then they, the witness actually sees it for the first time in their deposition. Um, so I just kind of wanted to bring that up as well, just as a potentially very kind of explosive um, yeah. approach. To handling. Yeah, we want, we want to avoid that. We want mentally healthy witnesses, mentally healthy witnesses, will testify more effectively <clears throat> and everybody's going to be different. And so getting somebody like us involved, I think could be really helpful. Well, thank you so much, Elisa Parker, for being on the podcast. Thank you to our audience. Uh, this is brought to you by Courtroom Sciences Litigation Psychology Podcast. We will see you next time. Bye. <laughs>